have a very special guest. Many of you might remember last session we had a sweet mama come in kind of at the last minute and just kind of um, she talked a little bit to y'all and she has this amazing book, <laughs> amazing book, especially if you have teenagers, How to Listen So Your Kids Will Talk. Um, incredible, incredible, incredible. Well, her name is Becky Harling and she is actually, she flew in from Colorado just to come and speak to us today. So when she came last, last session, y'all were all like, please get her, please get her. So guess what? The Lord worked it out and we got her. Um, so Becky is here today, so I want to give her ample time. Um, she does have a table out there. If you did not pick up How to Listen So Your Kids Will Talk book, um, wow, this, this is incredible incredible book. I've started it. She also has Psalms for the Anxious Heart, which she is going to be talking about anxiety today. Any moms anxious or stressed or worried? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Psalms for the Anxious Heart, a 30-day devotional for uncertain times. But her newest adventure, and y'all, this is the coolest story. Um, you know, I have so many people pressuring me in a lot of ways to do, um, do so much with Moms of Swords, right? Like, I think sometimes the Lord protects me from the magnitude of what this ministry actually does because it keeps me from um, pursuing things that he doesn't want us to pursue. Um, and if you've ever been around me in a leadership capacity, I tell my leaders all the time, like, it's just what, what Moses said, if, if God doesn't go with us, we're not going. And so I've never wanted to take Moms with Swords anywhere that the Lord didn't want us to go, but I've had pressure to do that. I've had pressure to write a book and uh, go podcast, which we are doing podcasts, but for me to do my own podcast. And, and all of these are phenomenal, incredible ideas. And I definitely feel the reach of Moms with Swords. It, it's already very big. Like I said, we, we, we've got people listening all over the world. So God is doing so much stuff. But I never want to do things that God doesn't orchestrate first. So I want to write a book, absolutely. I feel like I have the material to write a book. But God has not provided somebody to help me write a book. And until God does, guess what I'm going to do? I'm just going to be faithful with, with what's in front of me, right? Um, so Becky has an incredible story. Like, she has started The Connected Mom, a podcast with Becky Harling. And the way the Lord did this, the Lord brought exactly who needed to be brought to do this podcast. She was approached it was in the heart of God before it was in the heart of Becky, and God just produced this podcast, which is exactly what God will do when God is ready for it to be done. So, I love stories like that. They encourage me because I have people saying, why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing this? I'm like, because God hasn't provided me to do that yet. And when he does, I'll do it. So, I love this story. So, you are going to want to, it's on Google and Apple Podcast, The Connected Mom, which, oh my gosh, what an incredible title. Um, I think of John 15, just we're connected to the vine. So yeah. Becky, that is her newest venture. Um, like I said, she flew in from Colorado. We are so honored to have her. She's a big deal speaker, y'all. Big deal. A really big deal speaker. And I just always love, again, how the Lord brings about who he wants to be put in front of you. And I know Becky is one of those people. So I'm going to leave her books right here so you can look at them. But please stop by after um, she is done speaking and welcome sweet Becky to our Moms with Swords stage. You're welcome. so cute. Thank you. So I, I really am not a big deal. However, I do need to say everything I do I do in a big way. So one time I wanted to be like you moms with swords. And I was speaking at a church on a Sunday morning. And I think I was speaking on warfare. I don't really remember. But one of my friends has an ancient sword hanging in his office. So I asked if I could borrow it. And he said yes. And now the sword was really big and it probably weighed probably more than I do. And so there I was up in the front of this church and I was really getting into it, you know, and I was waving this sword and I, and I was flashing it around like we have the sword of the Lord. And, and I noticed people in the front row started like 
<laughs> backing up and making faces because they were afraid I was going to let go of the sword and they were going to get nailed. So, um, yeah, I'm really not a big deal. However, I do tend to do things in a big way. <laughs> so thank you for that introduction, Joy. And I do want to encourage you to check out the Connected Mom podcast. Our goal is to help you connect more deeply with God, more empathically with your fellow moms, and more intentionally with your child. So will you bow your heads with me? Because I want to give my mouth to the Lord before we open his word. Lord Jesus, what a privilege to be able to be here, to be able to open the word of God together. And Lord, we just want to say as moms, we love you. We love you so much. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would guard and guide our time together. Holy Spirit, I give you my mouth. I ask that you would fill it with only what you want me to say. Nothing of me, all of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So anxiety in motherhood is quite a big deal, isn't it? You know, I remember giving birth to my first child. Remember that moment in your lives? That first child, and they, they hand you that precious baby, and you're so madly in love with this child, and you just can't believe it came from you and your husband, and, and it's an amazing miracle, and I remember we took her home, and, and you know, uh, we had all kinds of family come and visit, so all day long, you know, we passed this bundle of joy around, and, and I was nursing her, and, and then we would pass her to somebody else. She was held all day long, and then and night came, and I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to get a good night's sleep, you know. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> and I just remember that first night, you know, it seems like anxiety always hits you at night. Have you ever noticed that? Anybody here struggle with worry at all in motherhood? I know you have nothing to worry about. But, you know, I, I just remember thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. I don't know how to raise a child. I'm afraid I'm going to mess her up for life, you know. And so panic hit me. And then, you know, when she was 10 months old, my husband and I left and flew to Sudan, East Africa, Khartoum, where we were going to be missionaries for two years. And while we were there, my oldest daughter, Bethany, contracted some type of weird virus and we had flown into Kenya to have a couple of weeks to rest before going back to Sudan and uh, the, she went into convulsions one night and she was 18 months at the time and I remember the doctor said we had to put her in the hospital and if there was anything I didn't want to do it was put my baby girl in an African hospital I was far away from home and I just, this felt overwhelming to me. And so I asked them for a cot to stay in the room next to her. And <clears throat> she was getting worse by the day. I remember at one point the doctor came in and I said, she doesn't seem to be getting better. She's getting worse. She's losing weight. She won't eat. Her fever's high. And, and he said to me, I know. What do you think we should do about that? And I just remember having this very carnal thought. I remember thinking, I want to smack you because you're the doctor, I'm not, and I don't know what to do. But you know what, girls, that night um, next to my cot, I remember getting down on my knees on that dirty cement floor in that hospital. And I remember saying, Lord Jesus, this child is yours. I love her more than I can express in this moment. But you love her even more than I do. I don't even know how that's possible. And, you know, by this time I was just like weeping before the Lord. And I remember telling the Lord, Lord, if you take her, I'm going to continue praising you. I'm going to continue following you and worshiping you. Because you mean even more to me than this baby girl. And that night, I actually was able to sleep. And um, the next morning, God healed Bethany. 
a monkey came to the window and for the first time in four days she sat up in bed said monkey <laughs> and you know that was the turnaround for her but <clears throat> along my journey of motherhood there has been plenty to worry about you know maybe we came home from Africa a few years into it and maybe you've never lived in Africa but there are plenty of worries here aren't there you know, I remember a season where I was really worried about one of my teenage daughters. The, the first uh, several of our teens really didn't get into the whole dating scene. They were more involved in sports and a whole lot of activities. And, you know, then our, our youngest daughter was quite beautiful and very charming. And I think every guy in high school wanted to date her. And I just remember crawling in bed with my husband one night and him saying, how did this happen? <laughs> and then he said, he said these profound words to me. He said, you know, Beck, four kids is a lot. And, and, and I want you to know, we went, my husband and I went for a hike just two weeks ago, you know, and we went out specifically to pray over the family. And I said to him, you know, babe, four kids is a lot. Because four kids becomes eight kids, because they're all married now. And then we have these beautiful little creatures, grandchildren, and I have 14 of them. And so my prayer list has grown exponentially, right? And when you think one family's doing great, then another family maybe goes through a battle that you didn't anticipate. And there's just always someone or something to worry about. And I don't know about you, but I always felt guilty for worrying because I grew up in church and I would go to church on Sunday and I would hear these messages about how anxiety was a sin. And then I became more worried because I was anxious. And then on top of that, I was feeling like I was sinning and, and it became this vicious cycle. I have good news for you today. <clears throat> Anxiety is not a sin. I know some of you are saying, did she really say that? Yes, anxiety is not a sin. And if you read your Bibles, which I hope you do, and in a minute we're going to open the Word of God, but if you read your Bible, you will find that many people wrestled with anxiety. In fact, the psalmist, David, who is one of the most passionate men in Scripture, in Psalm 94, 19, he says, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. And I remember when I read that verse for the first time thinking, oh, I have found my people, the psalmists. They wrestle with anxiety like I do. And they actually say they wrestle with it. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote, be anxious for nothing, which, by the way, if you analyze the Greek there, it means don't stay in a state of anxiety, wrote, I will send I think it was Epaphroditus to you, so that I might have less anxiety. And so this morning, I want to speak to you about letting go of anxiety, but holding on to the hope that comes through Jesus Christ. So when we let go, we have to grasp something. You know, there's a scripture verse in Psalm <clears throat> In Psalm 149, where the psalmist writes, May the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. Don't you love that? You know what? I pray that scripture over all 14 of my grandkids. Because we have been given two weapons to combat anxiety. We live in an anxious world right? You are raising kids, or maybe some of you have kids out of the home, and, and you're watching them grow their own kids in a very anxious world. Stress, anxiety, tension is all on the rise. COVID didn't help us any, did it? You know, because all of a sudden people were in isolation, and then you had to worry that if your kid got sick, maybe they had COVID, or maybe you're a working mom and all of a sudden you had to deal with online learning and it messed up the whole system because you couldn't send your kids to school. Or perhaps you're sending your kids to school 
and you keep hearing about school shootings and you're like what in the world you know Tracy my friend Tracy back here Tracy and I were talking and when we sent our kids to school I don't remember thinking oh a school shooting could happen there were other things I was worried about but not that recently I had three of my grandchildren with me um, over the weekend their mom and dad had to go away and Noah is six years old and he's in first grade <clears throat> and he got up before his sisters and so we were cuddling together you know and I had my coffee and I had given him some juice and we were cuddling on the chair and I was like how you doing Noah and he's like good Mimi and then he began to tell me you know Mimi this week at school we had a practice drill. Some of the kids had to hide under the teacher's desk. Some of them had to go in the closet. And we all had to be very quiet in case there's a bad guy on the property of their school. You know, and in my heart, I felt so sad that this little six-year-old has to practice drills and hide under the teacher's desk because of a possible threat on campus. This is the world we are raising kids in. This is the world some of your grandkids are growing up in. I talked with a mother, another mom a few weeks ago about her daughter being approached by another girl in junior high who wants to know, will she date her and will she have sex with her? This is the culture your kids are growing up in. And as a mom, <clears throat> we often feel surrounded. You ever have those moments where you feel surrounded? I mean, you feel surrounded by your own kids, probably, if they're little and in the home. You're like, let me just go to the bathroom for five minutes alone. But I mean surrounded by culture. You know, maybe you've heard a bad news report. You're watching the economy fail. You're hearing about school shootings on the news. And you feel surrounded. And it's like, God, how do I do this? Because I'm feeling anxious as a mom. I feel surrounded. I have good news for you. God has given us two weapons to fight the enemy with and to fight anxiety with. I want you, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, to open to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This is my all-time favorite Bible story, and in a few minutes you'll know why. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and I'm going to tell you the story. So after this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, with some of the Meunites, came to make war on Judah, on Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat at this time is the king of Judah. And so what's happening here is the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Meunites, they are surrounding Judah and they're coming to make war on Judah. They want to destroy God's people. This would kind of be like, here we are in this beautiful sanctuary church, and you hear a report that ISIS, Boko Haram, and another terrorist group are surrounding the building. You're going to feel anxious. See, anxiety is not going to go away anytime soon. I remember being with my husband in Nigeria in the year 2014, and we'd only been on the ground for 45 minutes. We were visiting, and uh, we were, I woke up. It had been a long flight, so I was sleeping in the van, and I opened my eyes because my husband said, Beck, wake up and pray. And I realized our van was surrounded by teenage boys pointing AK-47s at us, saying, we don't want to have to kill you. And I remember thinking, I don't really want that either. <laughs> and, but then, in the anxiety of that moment, I knew I needed a plan. And so I'm going to show you from the book of Second Chronicles what your plan needs to be because panic is going to come. You know, in that moment where you're teaching your teen to drive, man, if anything causes panic, that's it, right? And, you know, or when you find out what your school is teaching and you realize it's completely unbiblical, panic's going to occur. When your child spikes 105, you know, one of my grandchildren, this is a true story, Three weeks ago, one of my grandchildren, little two-year-old, spiked 107 fever. 
I've never heard of a fever that high. They had to rush him to the ER, and, you know, they were able to bring it down, but they never did get answers. The answers were, oh, it was just some virus. 107. That'll put you into a panic attack, right? So in your panic, you need a plan. So that's what I'm going to give you. So the people come and tell Jehoshaphat, hey, we're surrounded. The Ammonites, the Meunites, the Moabites, they're all coming to make war on us. And Jehoshaphat is alarmed. No kidding, I'd be alarmed too. He's alarmed. He's anxious in his spirit. But then it goes on to say, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. I love that. Ladies, in this day and age, while you are raising your kids, you need to resolve that you're going to ask the Lord. In those moments when you don't know what to do with the two-year-old that's throwing a fit on the floor. In those moments when you don't know what to do because your junior hire is being approached with drugs in school. In those moments where you're getting ready to send your child off to college. In those moments when you are a grandmother and your kids are not raising their kids like you would like them to. You need a resolution. You need to resolve now I'm going to ask the Lord. I'm going to go to the Lord first. I'm not even going to go to Google. I'm not going to go to WebMD. I'm going to go to the Lord. That is the most critical decision you need to make in raising your kids. I remember um, several years ago now, my youngest daughter said, Mom, how in the world did you raise us without Google? I said, you know what? We didn't have Google back then. Isn't that crazy to think about? We didn't have Google back then. We got on our knees. And I just remember saying, oh, Lord, we don't know what to do. And that's what Jehoshaphat says. He goes on and he begins this beautiful prayer. Lord God of our ancestors, are you not the God in heaven? Power and might are in your hands. You know what? I want you to say that with me. Power and might are in your hands. Come on, louder than that. Power and might are in your hands. Man, we need that reminder, don't we? As we watch events unfold around the world, as we watched a shift in our culture where what was right is now wrong. What was wrong is now right. As we watch, we need this reminder. Oh, Lord God, are you not the God of the heavens? Power and might are in your hands. And then Jehoshaphat continues this prayer, and he calls for a day of fasting and prayer. And then he says these words, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Oh, I can't tell you how many times my husband, Steve, and I prayed those exact words while raising four kids. Oh, Lord God, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That is a prayer that I believe with all my heart. Every mama out there, whether your kids are infants, whether they're teens, whether they're in college, whether they're left home and they're raising kids— Every mama needs this prayer. Oh, Lord God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And then <clears throat> Jehazel, the prophet, stands up and he has a prophetic word. And he says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Ah, oh, don't you love that? I, I remember a season in one of our kids' lives where she was really struggling and I was doing my part. I was getting down on my knees every morning. I was praying through the book of Ephesians, which, by the way, is a great idea to do, especially for your teens. Put their name in there and just pray it over them. So I was praying through the whole book of Ephesians every morning. And, you know, I remember this reminder coming from the Lord. Becky, the battle's not yours. It's mine. I'm never going to stop pursuing her. I'm never going to stop chasing her down with my love. You don't have to fight the battle alone. You fight with me on your knees, but I've got it. I'm not going to stop pursuing her. I wonder how many of you, before I continue this story, need that word. I wonder how many of you are concerned about 
teens who you see making foolish choices. I wonder how many of you are concerned because your college kids have walked away from God. I wonder how many of you are concerned because some of your kids are in relationships that they shouldn't be in. God is saying to you this morning, it's not your battle. Your battleground is on your knees. Your battleground is on your knees. But it's my battle, and I'm not going to stop pursuing them. God will never, ever, ever stop pursuing your child's heart. Doesn't that do your heart good? I need that reminder, just like you need that reminder. So then Jehoshaphat, well, Jehazel goes on to say, take up your positions. Don't you love that? Take up your positions and stand firm. Ladies, I want to challenge you this morning. Take up your positions in your homes. And you know where your position is? It's on your knees. It's on your knees. You see, God has given us two weapons to fight the enemy and to, and to pray a protective covering over our children. He has first given us the power of praise. Did you know that Satan is allergic to praise? He cannot stand where we are praising God. And so when fear comes knocking, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're in that moment of panic, you start praising God. You start praising God. You are good. I'm so thankful for you. And you praise God. And Satan is going to leave you alone. And I dare say you'll fall back to sleep. The second weapon he gives us is the sword. That's why you're called moms with swords. Joy didn't just pick that name out of the sky it's because you have the sword of the lord which is the word of god and so you learn and practice praying scripture over your kids hearts take up your positions and stand firm i am convinced and i'm well into this parenting journey now i've got 14 grandkids that the greatest gift you can give your kids Yes, love them by, for sure, but pray scripture over them. You know, your child's not going to change because you give a great lecture. Anybody's kid change because, wow, mom, that was such a phenomenal lecture you gave me. I feel so convicted I'm going to change my heart, right? <laughs> Hasn't happened in my lifetime. I mean, if it happens in your home, I might want, want to know about it because maybe your lecture was better than mine. But no child that I know has ever changed because they were scolded or because they had a great, you know, were given a great lecture. You, you change your child's heart, you really can't. However, you have God on your side. Change happens when you get on your knees. Take up your position and stand firm. And then Jehoshaphat comes up with the craziest battle plan ever. They haven't tried this yet over in Ukraine and Russia, I don't think. Although the Ukrainian believers are extremely strong. But I love this battle plan. Jehoshaphat says, I know what we're going to do. We're going to pull together the worship team. And the worship team is going to go out front and all the soldiers with all the weapons are going to be behind them. And we're going to have the choir sing praises to God. Now, my husband and I have served a lot of churches, right? We've been married 43 years. Steve has been a lead pastor for 35 of those years. We know a little bit about worship teams. And I'm sure this never happens in your church. But every now and then, there's a little bit of competition on worship teams. I'm guessing on this day, nobody was saying, I want a solo part. I want to go out front. You know, and maybe it went down like this. Hey, Jehoshaphat, you know, I, I'm just saying, have you heard those tenors lately? They're a little pitchy. Maybe send them out first. Or Jehoshaphat, what about the altos? They never show up for choir practice on time. Why don't we send them out first? I mean, this is such a ridiculous, from a human perspective, battle plan. 
they're not going out behind guns and cannons and whatever else they used, bow and arrows back then. They're going out completely unguarded. But they're going out singing praises to the Lord Most High. And here's the most amazing part of the story. As the choir begins to sing, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Straight out of Psalm 136, as the choir begins singing and the, the army comes behind them and they approach the top of the hill, then God sent his angels and annihilated their enemies. When they got to the top of the hill, everybody was dead. They never had to raise another weapon. Isn't that a cool story? And they had three days of plunder after that. Ladies, God is calling you to a position of praise and worship. He's calling you to begin being intentional about praising God and praying scripture. Because panic isn't going to go away anytime soon. You will feel anxious at some part later this week. You're going to hear a news report, and it's going to stir up stress and anxiety in you. But you have weapons. You have the word of God and praise. Those are the two weapons that God has given us. I first learned how to do this at age 42 when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'll never forget the phone call that came that said, Becky, you do have cancer. It's very aggressive. We need to do a double complete mastectomy. And Steve and I were still very much in the thick of raising our children. And I was scared. Steve was scared. And I called a mentor of mine. And I said, hey, I just have been diagnosed with cancer. I'm really anxious. Can you pray with me? She did pray with me on the phone. And then she gave me the most bizarre challenge I've ever been given in my life. She said, you know what, Becky? I want you for the next five days, when you first get up in the morning, I want you to spend 20 minutes praising God before you open your Bible. Then open your Bible and do your Bible reading. And I remember thinking, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. I hardly feel like jumping up and down saying, wow, I'm going to lose both the sisters in a week. You know, I was like, this feels very inauthentic to me. I don't feel like praising God for cancer. Glory, hallelujah, facing all this surgery. She said, I'm not asking you to praise God for cancer. I'm asking you to praise God for who he is above the cancer. And so I thought, well, I have nothing left to, I have nothing to lose. I'm going to face this surgery either way in 10 days. So the first morning I got up, and I remember getting down on my knees. The kids were all still in bed. And I remember saying, Lord, I'm here to praise you for 20 minutes. I don't know how I'm going to do that. But if you will help me, Holy Spirit, I'm going to do it. And then because I'm slightly obsessive compulsive, I was like, well, I know the alphabet. Anybody in here know the alphabet? None of you raised your hands. You need to go back to kindergarten. Um, so... I knew the alphabet. I'm like, I'm going to use the alphabet, and I'm going to praise my way through the alphabet. And so I began, Lord Jesus, I praise you because you are almighty. And this is not catching me by surprise. Lord Jesus, I praise you because you are the bread of life and the blessed controller of all things. I praise you because you are compassionate and you're my creator. You understand how every cell is interacting with every other cell in my body. I praise you because you are my deliverer and you are the, the, the great divine one. I praise you because you are eternal. You are eternally faithful, good, and holy holy and <clears throat> your nature never changes i praise you because you are infinite in your wisdom and just in all your ways i praise you because you're the king of kings and the lord of lords and you are mighty enough to move mountains and yet you're near enough to hear every whisper of my heart i praise you because you're opulent in your splendor and you're completely omniscient i praise you because you are powerful enough to to end this cancer that is raking over my body i praise you because 
<coughs> you quiet me with your love. And when I feel frantic and frazzled, your love surrounds me and you quiet me. I praise you because you have clothed me in your righteousness. I am clothed from head to toe in your righteousness. I praise you because you are the good shepherd who quiets me when I'm anxious and covers my sin at the same time. I praise you because you are absolute truth. You alone are the truth. You said I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by you. I praise you because you are understanding and you are the wonderful counselor. I praise you because you are victorious. You hold the keys to heaven and hell and you are now seated at the right hand of God in absolute victory. And you know what? As I went through the alphabet, the 20 minutes flew by. And a strange thing began to happen. God's presence came so close. It wasn't that God moved closer. It's that the Holy Spirit opened my ears to hear his voice. He opened my heart to feel his love in ways I had never felt it before. You have been given two weapons to fight your anxiety with. Worry, fear, stress, depression, it's not going to go away anytime soon. But God has given you the weapons you need. You need to unleash the power of praise. When that panic attack comes in the middle of the night and you're thinking, oh, I don't know what to do about this, and you feel panic coming, you turn your panic into praise. Your second weapon is the word of God, which is the sword, the double-edged sword. You be the mama that's going to pray scripture over her kids. My husband was raised in a missionary family. His grandparents went to the, missionary, went to the mission field in Africa at 1925 uh, <clears throat> when there were still cannibals. And uh, then his parents went out. But Steve's grandmother was quite the woman of prayer. And I'll end with this story. We have told our children and now our grandchildren this story. There was a day where she was in her little hut and uh, Grandpa was out in the villages far away. And she looked out her front window and she saw black oiled bodies of the surrounding tribes snaking their way down the mountain and surrounding her house. She felt surrounded in every way. And there was a knock on the door, and she opened the door, and there was <coughs> one of the warriors who had his war paint on and a spear. And he said, You're, you have a pan roof on your house your house. Grandpa had put the pan roof. And he said, it's offended our God, Taga. And because of that, we don't have rain. And we've come to kill you. And Grandma said, well, they said, get your husband, and you have to leave or we're going to kill you. And she said, well, my husband is out in the village. Can you give me a little time? And they said, yes. And Grandma grabbed her houseworker, and they got down on their knees together in that little African hut. And they prayed, perhaps like they had never prayed before, for 45 minutes, an hour. And it, Grandma kept praying, Oh, Lord God, are you not the God of the heavens? Power and might are in your hands. Send the rain. And that afternoon, true story, there was a torrential downpour from the heavens and hundreds came to Christ that day because they realized that the God who holds the power and might in his hands was greater than the God that they had created to worship. Listen, that grandmother went on and Steve, my husband, tells a story about going to say goodbye to her. She was in the nursing home and 
we were several children in, and she, so Steve just flew by himself to say goodbye to his grandmother, and his grandmother, she had really thick glasses she couldn't see, and um, she pulled his face down next to hers, and she said, Steve, I want you to know, I've prayed for you every single day of your life. Now I'm getting ready to go to heaven. Don't let me down now. <laughs> you know what? When I'm on my deathbed, I want to be able to tell my grandchildren, I've prayed for you every day of your life. I have unleashed the power of praise over your life. I have prayed scripture over your life because I love you and I want you to walk with Jesus. Ladies, we are living in one of the most pivotal moments in history. I believe we are getting closer and closer and closer to the hour and time when Jesus is going to come back. I want to end by just asking you a couple of questions. I want you to close your eyes so you can really think about these questions. What do you most often worry about as a mom? Is it that your kids will walk with Jesus? Is it that they'll survive? Is it sickness? What most often tempts you to worry? What emergency scripture verses do you know by heart so that when panic comes, you can go to those verses in your mind in a moment? You know, you, when you're driving a car, you can't grab your Bible, right? when panic comes because you'll get in a wreck. So I believe all of us need some emergency verses that we know we have them memorized and they can just roll off our tongue. When I'm in the car and panic hits, I go immediately, God, you are my refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Sometimes I go to the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What are your emergency verses? How, how do you intentionally practice praising God in your life? You know what I do? Every morning, this morning included, I grab my coffee, I get on my knees, I turn on my worship music, and I spend the first 20 minutes to half an hour of my day just praising and thanking God for who he is. Now, I know some of you have babies. There's nothing wrong with holding a baby on your lap while you're praising God. There's nothing wrong with setting it on the YouTube channel, on your TV, and ha letting your kids have a little dance party. In your heart, you can be praising God. How are you intentional about praise? And then my last question for you is, who are your prayer people? Who are the girlfriends in your life that you know you could text and say, hey, I need prayer, I'm in a panic today? Lord Jesus, thank you that you have given us weapons to fight the enemy. You have given us the amazing opportunity to praise you. And Lord, we love praising and worshiping you. And so we thank you for that weapon. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you that you have called us as mamas to live a life of praise and prayer. We praise you that you have called us to take up our positions on our knees on behalf of our families. And we know that you bend down to listen because your word tells us that. Lord, I just want to pray blessing over each of these mamas in the room. I feel like some of them are heavy-hearted, worrying about their teens. Some of them are heavy-hearted, worrying about their grade school children and the types of schools their kids are having to go to. Some of them are worried about grandchildren and what kind of world they're living in. Lord Jesus, I bless these mamas. I know your heart is for them and not against them. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would fill them with courage, just like you did Mary, who was your earthly mother. Fill them with courage to do the task that you've laid before them. Help them to remember the power of praise and the power of praying scripture. In Jesus' name, amen.
you, thank you, Becky. Wow. If she's going to be around for a little while, if you guys want to, um, on your way to small group, we're going to have plenty of time in our small groups this morning, which is awesome because you have lots to talk about. Um, so, but Becky will be around. She'll probably be back there at her table. So definitely go visit her and um, wise women follow wise women. So if you have questions, definitely just go ask her. Um, what a great morning. What a great word, Becky. Wow. Um, and I just want to speak this over you as you go to your small groups. This is a verse that has been just really resonating in my life over the last seven, eight months. And it's Philippians 4. It's very familiar, but I want to read it out of the Amplified, uh, or not the Amplified, the Passion Translation. It's uh, Philippians 4, 8. Um, I'm sorry, 4, 6, and 7. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled request before God and overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Jesus Christ. So moms, if you're anxious, if you're worried, just like Becky said, go to your sword, go to your worship, and fight. Do not relent. The enemy will not relent. You better not relent. So I bless you. We'll see you next week. If you missed some announcements, ask a friend who was here early um, and go see Becky at the table. And don't forget to pick up your bracelets, your registration gifts, and your hat if you order them. And we'll see you next Thursday. Only two more weeks after today. Two more Thursdays. If you have a friend who's not been coming, who used to come, <laughs> Hey, let's, let's, let's charge each other to get here. We have th two weeks left, y'all. Come on. I know it's hard to get here, but like I said, we have like 120-something registered, and you see how many people are in this room. Come on. Come on. And I have people saying, oh, but we want 12 weeks. We want 12 weeks. Come on. Let's get to nine weeks. So if you've got people, I, it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's one of my greatest frustrations. I'm just going to be really honest. Like, it's just, I know it's so hard, and it makes me really mad at the enemy. It makes me really mad because I know he doesn't want you here on a Thursday morning, just like he didn't want you there on Sunday morning. But let's just commit to these next two weeks. Talk to your friend. Tell her to get here. Let's finish stronger than we began. So we can do it. We can do it. So I'm going to see y'all next week. Love you guys.